Hello everyone, and welcome to my armor tier list for Monster Hunter World. I have a whole variety of subjects to talk about. I think I'm going to kind of break it down for you here like a menu. First, we're going to be talking about becoming powerful early. What armor do I unlock if I want to be powerful really, really early in the game? After that, we're going to talk about what skills actually constitute the meta. Like, what are you actually supposed to be going for? And then once you understand what the goals are, we're ready to talk about which pieces of armor fit that prescription. Which pieces of armor can give us the things that we want? And the armor is really going to be broken down into two lists. You're going to have the offensive meta and the defensive meta. So for people who want to survive better, there's going to be a few pieces of armor that really help you do that. For people who want to do more damage, there's going to be a whole bunch of pieces of armor that help you do that. Mostly in Monster Hunter World, we're focused on damage. All right, so let's start by talking about how to become powerful early. The vast majority of armor in low rank and high rank are terrible. Go ahead and build whatever set you're going to build in low rank. It could be the Rathalos Helmet, the Rathalos Chest. Those have attack boost and weakness exploit. Weakness exploit, at least, is, is decent. But yeah, you can build whatever you want. The point is to save your materials. When you get to high rank, it's kind of the same story. You want to build one set, probably rank 6, rank 7, and then just hold on to it and do your best to get through the Elder Dragons. Be sure to use SOS Flares. You want to have money. You want to have materials by the time you're all done with it, right? Uh, it's just a lot of the armor is really bad. You don't want to be wasting a lot of your money on that armor. What you want to do is finish the story so that you can go play Contract, Trouble in the Ancient Forest. That's the Witcher collaboration quest. It's the easy quest, right? You're going to be playing by yourself as Geralt, and when you're done with it, you, you're going to get materials from the Leshen. Uh, tons of spoilers, I suppose I should have started with that. But you're going to get parts from the Leshen, and you can use those parts to go build the Geralt set. So the Geralt set is a full armor set, meaning you're not allowed to mix and match it. You have to wear the whole thing. You're going to look like Geralt when you put it on. And it comes with a whole bunch of super useful skills. Let's talk about those skills. You're getting three levels of health boost. Health boost, in my opinion, is the number one defensive skill in the game. The reason why it's so good, it raises your health threshold so that it's harder for a monster to like two-shot you, basically. So you get more of an opportunity to run away and heal. So health boost is the number one defensive skill, and with the Geralt set, you get three levels of it. You're also getting recovery speed. So the way the recovery speed works is when you've taken damage, you'll have a your green bar of health, which is what you have left, and then a red bar of health, which is recoverable health. Recovery speed will help you get that back sooner. It's not really a big deal. It just happens to come with this set. But then you also have this thing called super recovery, where your health just slowly ticks back at the same time. Even after all the red health is uh, totally healed up, it'll continue to heal past the red. So you have all those things coming from this set, and that makes this kind of a defensive set. It's not just defensive, though. You're also getting three levels of weakness exploit. So what you're going to be talking about with me when we get to the meta skills, we're going to be talking about how important weakness exploit is. You're getting all three levels of it without requiring any decorations just for wearing the Geralt set. You're also getting Marathon Runner. Marathon Runner is really only good for one weapon, the Dual Blades, so you could build Dual Blades with this set if you want to. Attack Boost is there, two levels of Attack Boost, two levels of Critical Eye, two levels of Bombardier. So it's, it's a, essentially it's a very good set because it throws together a lot of valuable skills onto one set, and you have all these decoration slots left over as well. Alongside the Geralt armor set, you should also build a Devil Joe weapon of your choice. Except for the bow, the Devil Joe bow's not that good. It doesn't pair well with the Geralt armor set. So build any of the Devil Joe weapons, and then finally, in your charm slot, add the Handicraft charm. Even if you can only get it to level 1, even if you can only get it to level 2, go ahead and add that Handicraft charm. So all these three things together, Devil Joe weapon, a Handicraft charm, and the Geralt armor set, is making you very powerful early on in the game. After talking about how to become powerful early, I said that we would talk about the meta, and that's what we're going to do now. So what exactly is the armor meta in Monster Hunter World, and where did it come from? Imagine two scenarios with me, if you will. Imagine a scenario where you have a lot of defensive skills, and it takes you 10 minutes to kill a monster. Now imagine a second scenario where you have almost only offensive skills, but a little bit of vitality on the side, and you defeat that same monster in five minutes. This is where the meta is coming from. So it turns out if you take almost all damage on your build, you're able to finish your fights in a reasonable amount of time. If you take way too many, let's say luxury skills or defensive skills or utility skills, the fight drags on and on and on. And as it turns out, when your fight takes too long, the game, the fun that you're having in the game kind of goes down, right? Also, if you were to go into a fight with a lot of defensive skills, fight for 10 minutes and then lose, 
that would be really frustrating because you would be getting no rewards after 10 minutes. Whereas if you have only offensive skills and you lost in five minutes and then you tried again and defeated it in another five minutes, you would still be defeating it within 10 minutes, which is what you would have gotten guaranteed consistently on a strictly defensive build. So this is really why Monster Hunter World leans toward lots and lots of damage. There's all kinds of benefits when you do tons of damage. You mount the monster faster. You knock the monster over sooner. You cause the monster to flinch sooner. And when the fight is over, the monster really doesn't have an opportunity to attack you anymore, right? So a lot of the times when you're losing to a monster is because that monster has one or two moves that are really good at wiping the team out. And if you defeat a monster in five minutes as opposed to 10 minutes, that monster really doesn't get as many opportunities to use that team killing move. So a lot of our builds today are focused around whatever skills are giving you the most damage. You can kind of divide these into categories even. You've got melee weapons, you've got uh, bow guns, and you've got elemental weapons, and then probably the fourth one would be you've got explosive weapons. Now explosive weapons, I'm not referring to blast damage. Blast damage is an ailment. Explosive damage is a damage type that does the same damage every time it does set damage. A great example of this would be shelling on the gun lance. The shelling always does the same damage. Okay, so you've got these maybe four groups of damage and you, you build them up using slightly different skills. In fact, it gets, you can get more and more distinctive in the skills depending on weapon class if you want to, or you can focus on all the skills that pretty much everything seems to share together. All right, but four really distinct lines. Melee, bowgun, elemental, explosive. With melee builds, you're talking about weapons that have sharpness. So you want to have white sharpness if possible. There's some really rare exceptions where you'll still use that weapon, but with blue sharpness, trust me, it's a very rare occurrence, but mostly we're talking about white sharpness weapons here. You want to maintain that white sharpness because it gives you a damage modifier and it makes it less likely that your weapon is going to bounce off of a hard part on the monster's body. And we discovered this set bonus skill called Master's Touch and it's really in the end game set bonus skill. Set bonus skill, as you recall, is a skill that you receive for wearing a certain number of armor from that armor set. That's why it's called a set bonus skill. So there's a set bonus skill called Master's Touch. You all know I was going to talk about this, of course, and that's coming from the Draken armor set and the Teostra Gamma armor set. Okay, so right off the bat, there's the meta for the blade weapons. So with Master's Touch, the way it works is when you land a critical hit on your target, you don't lose sharpness at all, right? This is a really big deal because we already have an incentive to have high affinity. Not only do you get bonus damage when you land a critical hit, you can build another skill called Critical Boost. It's really when you add Critical Boost onto your build that you start your, your damage output starts to go up in an exponential line. So now we've already known that Crit Boost and 100% Affinity together are really important. Now we have this extra skill that also makes it so that you can't lose White Sharpness, which means you don't lose the White Sharpness modifier and your weapon doesn't bounce. All of that's a really big deal for damage output. So blade weapons, this is the meta, okay? And various blade weapons will have different specific skills that they take, you know, they may take it, the other one may not. For example, some of the weapons are going to take maximum might. Maximum might uh, is a static affinity type where if your stamina bar is full, you get a big bonus to your affinity. If, if you're recharging stamina, that affinity is missing, right? And you'll have weapons that can't use that, like the bow, and like especially the dual blades, All right? Right, that's a, that's a weapon that's going to be using Master's Touch, but it can't use maximum might. Uh, you might talk about the Grey Sword. The Grey Sword needs the focus skill in order to uh, speed up its rate of fire, right? If you want to attack faster with the Grey Sword, you gotta bring the focus skill. So every melee weapon kind of have has its own thing, but what they have in common is that they use Master's Touch, White Sharpness, 100% Affinity, and critical boost. When we talk about 100% affinity, we got to talk about a few skills. Uh, attack boost four gives you 5% affinity. Crit eye gives you, does it give you up to 30? I can't remember. I don't think it gives you up to 30. Maybe I'm wrong though. Uh, maximum might does give you up to 30. You got to take three levels of it. It's a medium decoration. And once again, it only works when your stamina is full. So weapons that eat up stamina, sometimes you don't take maximum might on them. It really depends on what you're talking about. Also, the most important skill in this group of, of, of uh, affinity skills, weakness exploit. So weakness exploit, when you attack a part of the monster's body that has a weakness, a hit zone value of 45 or greater to that particular damage type, you're gonna get a, uh, an attack on a weak spot. You're gonna get weak spot damage. And with weakness exploit, you can quickly bring your affinity up to 100%. So this is a big deal. You're combining crit eye, max might, 
weakness exploit, affinity, affinity augmentations, and attack boost uh, with the 5% affinity. You're stacking all of these together to get your affinity up to 100%. You're bringing crit boost 3, right? So you're getting a lot of damage between 100% affinity and crit boost 3. And then you've got your white sharpness, and you got your master's touch together as well. And it's all coming together to do lots and lots of damage. Now that's for melee weapons. For bow guns, it's entirely different. So for bow guns, you're using a set bonus skill called Razor Sharp, Spare Shot. It does two different things. It's one of those skills that has two different uses. For Razor Sharp, what it's doing is it's reducing the amount of sharpness you lose every time you attack. So you could potentially pair this skill with the weapon that has very bad affinity and you don't intend to bring up the affinity of it. Of course, this never happens. I've never used a build that does this. However, here's a legitimate use of it with the gun lances in the game. The gun lances, they can use Master's Touch for their physical parts of their attacks, but it doesn't affect shelling. So shelling pairs very well with Razor Sharp for keeping the sharpness up on your gun lance. Unfortunately, I don't even tend to use that very often. A third time you might see it is when you're using the charge blade. I have seen some charge blade builds that use razor sharp in order to maintain sharpness even while you're using the SAED attacks. All right, so that's razor sharp. That's half the skill. The other half is spare shot. Spare shot is a bowgun meta skill. You pretty much bring this on the vast majority of bowgun builds with very few exceptions. <laughs> very few exceptions. And what it's allowing you to do is there's a chance for you to fire a bullet and for that bullet to not be consumed. Uh, it doesn't come out of your reserves. It's just like a free bullet. So this effectively gives you more reserves and it gives you a larger clip. It's really important for maxing out your DPS with the with the bow gun, whether it be heavy bowgun or light bowgun. The other major skill for the bow guns is definitely the free element ammo up skill. So free element ammo up is also a double skill skill. Free element is unlocking a hidden hidden secondary damage type like fire, water, or an ailment like sleep, paralysis. Uh, the other side of it, ammo up, is it's increasing the, the clip size of your bowgun. So you put spare shot on, that increases the clip size, and you put ammo up on, that also increases the clip size. So with the bowguns, the reason why this is so, so important is because you don't want to have to reload your weapon. Anytime you're reloading, you're not shooting, this lowers your damage output. The less times you reload, the more damage output you have, the more sustained fire you have, right? Really important. So that's the bowgun meta. The bowguns also do a few other things. Uh, depending on what ammo type you're using, you'll typically have to build for that ammo type. You'll see some combinations where you'll need a little bit of the meta skills for dealing elemental damage with bowguns, or you might see something else called the shot decorations. You have force shot, or I should say normal shots, pierce shots and spread shot okay and these are the they're, they're basically one large decoration slot there is armor for all three of these skills but there's no meta armor for these skills so really it just comes down to decorations the three pieces of armor that can fulfill these skills pierce shot is going to be the wrath soul coil alpha i believe alpha and it's a very inefficient coil and pierce ammo itself is not that powerful so this is an honorable mention. Another honorable mention is the normal shots, which is coming from the Black Diablos leggings. And then the third piece is actually pretty legit for new players. It's the Lavasiath Greaves. These are giving you spread shots. So if you don't have the spread shot decoration and you want to use spread ammo, and spread ammo is very powerful, use the Lavasiath Greaves. It's also used with the bow, okay? So that one's getting an honorable mention. It's not meta, but it is pretty good if you're you don't have a spread decoration yet. All right, so that's the bow guns. We can talk about the elemental meta as well. Elemental meta includes weapons that have really a fast attack speed, particularly bows are going to be part of this, as well as dual blades. For these two weapons, they have very fast attack speeds, so the majority of the time you're dealing with elemental damage. But there's a lot of mid-speed weapons that deal elemental damage as well. There's also the elemental uh, ammo types on the bow guns, which we just mentioned. We said that the bow guns would occasionally use elemental meta armor as well. What do we mean by elemental meta armor? armor. So there's really one particular set bonus skill is called critical element and is replacing critical boost. Okay. So you don't need critical boost. There are exceptions. Like let's say you're using the bow or you're using the dual blades. Well, they do deal raw damage as well. So you could take crit boost if it fits into your build, but you're prioritizing critical element. So you get critical element and you pair that with the hundred percent affinity once again. So those affinity skills, attack boost four, crit I seven, Max Might 3, Weakness Exploit 3, 
Those are all coming back into play, except for bows, I should mention, uh, probably dual blades as well. You don't really bring maximum might. Maximum might, again, is dependent on your stamina bar being full. This is not true for dual blades and for bows most of the time. Uh, in fact, for bows, ever. So you just don't use maximum might with them. You use, you know, maybe you're using a, an affinity augmentation to reach that 100% affinity. Also, for bows, I should mention, a part of their build meta includes constitution. There's no real meta constitution pieces of armor, but there is a charm that gives you three levels of constitution, and that's a level that's a that's a medium decoration slot. So very often you'll see the constitution charm in those bow builds. All right. So for elemental damage to get that crit element, you're having to bring two pieces of armors. Any piece of armor related to the Rathalos. You've got uh, the Rathalos armor. The Wrath Soul Armor, that's coming from Azure Rathalos. And then finally, you have a, a special event quest armor called the Azure Star Lord Armor. You'll want to pick that up as well. And various pieces of this armor are being used more than the others. I would definitely say the Wrath Soul Helmet is being used. For the chest piece, you'll see both the Rathalos chest piece and the Wrath Soul chest piece being used. For the coil, you'll see the Rathalos coil being used in fire builds. There's also the Azure Star Lord coil being used here. It gives you one level of handicraft, which is really all you need on the Devil Joe weapons, for example. And then in the leg slot, I, I don't think I've ever used this myself. Maybe somebody in the comment section can tell me if any truly meta builds used this, but you have the Azure Star Lord Greaves. I'm betting that it's not generally taken, though. So building critical element used to be pretty standard for getting elemental damage, although I should mention, the Kiar weapons have really changed a lot of that. For a lot of elemental Kiar weapons, since critical element is built in, all you have to do is go build Draken at this point. You just build for your typical crit boost 3, top affinity, white handicraft. You know, if you're talking about the bows, the bows don't really benefit from any of that, which is also why the Kiar bows, uh, I've heard, are not quite as good as some of the other weapon classes that receive the Kiar weapons and can really abuse the Draken armor along with that weapon. Okay, so we've talked about melee damage, we've talked about bowgun damage, we've talked about elemental damage, that leaves the fourth category, and the fourth category, of course, is the explosive damage. Explosive damage? Well, there's a variety of weapons that use it. The bowguns use it when they use sticky ammo, when they use wyvern ammo. The gun lances definitely use explosive damage. You've got normal shelling, long shelling, wide shelling. There is a gun lance build with the Devil Joe gun lance that doesn't use any shelling, but that's like an exception. The charge blades use shelling. Particularly, you have the Diablos charge blade and the Kulf Taroth horn charge blade. These use impact files, and these are counted as explosive damage. And really when we're talking about explosive damage types, we're talking about a few skills. You've got focus, you've got artillery. Artillery directly boosts the damage and uh, magazine capacity, right? Capacity boost. For gun lances, capacity boost is going to give you an extra shell. For the charge blades, capacity boost is going to give you an extra file. Now, capacity boost does not affect the heavy bowguns. The heavy bowguns use the ammo up skill in order to hold more ammo, so capacity boost is not important to them. One of the saddest things about capacity boost is that there's not really any strong armors that will give it to you. You've got the uh, uh, the Dodogama legs and you've got the high metal coil. Those are your two options and they're both terrible. So for new players, you're going to be using those pieces of armor. For players who have been playing longer, you're going to use your, your decorations. For the artillery, it's the same deal. You really don't have many choices. You've got like the Dodogama coil and then you've got the, your best option obviously is going to be the charm slot where you can build three levels of artillery. However, if you can just have three levels of artillery decorations, this typically will open up more builds for you. So you want to have artillery decorations. Finally, we have the focus skill, which affects all three of the groups that I mentioned. Focus is used with the bow guns to get your special ammo types back faster. Focus on the charge blade allows you to charge the files sooner, which means you're allowed to use your most powerful combination sooner, the SAED. And then on the gun lances, they use focus to charge their shells faster. So with the gun lance, you have a regular shelling and then you have charge shelling. Charge shelling is where you hold the button down. It takes a little while for the shot to come out and it deals bonus damage. Focus allows you to do that faster. Luckily for focus, we actually do have a piece of meta armor for building this. It would be the Damascus chest plate, right? You have other options as well. The Damascus coil could be used. The Kushala de Aura van braces could be used. 
You've got the Diablos Nero's helmet. That could be used even. Uh, so you have other options, but really it's, it's the Damascus chest plate that you see more than any other because the chest plate on builds are is usually pretty easy to swap in and out. So it's an exchangeable piece of armor. It's also used with great swords, by the way. Great swords use the focus skill in order to increase their rate of fire, the, the, the speed that they attack. All right, so we've talked about what the meta is. It took us a while, but now you already have some great ideas about what armor sets you should be pursuing. Draken armor, Teostra armor, Senegiva armor, and then really it comes down to individual pieces of armor like the Damascus chest plate that we pointed out. This is the part where we really start to break into a, uh, a kind of like a tier list for the armor. We want to start to go in and start to look at every piece of armor. One thing that's important to understand about the Draken armor is that you can give up one piece of armor and still have the master's touch skill. Very often you'll take up uh, the helmet slot will be given up for something, the chest slot will be given up for something. You don't often see the van braces being given up, they're very efficient. The coil will often be given up, and then on a rare occasion you'll see the legs being given up for something like a wide range build. Okay, and then on the Teostra Gamma set, it's a little different. Teostra Gamma, you can reach Master's Touch with only three pieces of armor. The three pieces you see taken are the helmet and the legs, both of those are Gamma, and then the arms, you'll take the Gamma arms when you intend to finish building crit eye. Alternatively, you'll see the alpha van braces when you don't need max crit eye, so you go straight to weakness exploit. So those are the pieces you see being used for the Teostra Gamma Master's Touch. Now we're going to be talking about the individual pieces of armor. I'm going to be talking about why they're so powerful. Usually it's because they're efficient and they usually offer something toward the offensive meta or even the defensive meta, which we'll point out as we go along. I happen to have all the important pieces of armor in my inventory, so this part will be the fun part. Starting with the helmets category, we have the Emperor's Crown Beta. It has two levels of Evade Extender. There's really very rare situations that I would actually consider building Evade Extender. I, I've, I've tried to like Evade Extender, I really have. It's useful on the heavy bow gun. it can give you a lot of extra range with your long range roll already. It's useful on the Switch Axe. The Switch Axe is known for not having a lot of maneuverability. Also on the Gun Lance, which has some of the worst maneuverability of all the weapons. However, I've found that it's better to just learn to play with low maneuverability and save those extra decoration slots for more damage output. But if you had to build a Vade Extender, Emperor's Crown Beta is easily one of the best ways to build it. Next, we have the Dragon King Eye Patch with Weakness Exploit. It gives you two levels of Weakness Exploit. I already explained before, Weakness Exploit triggers on body parts that have a his own value of 45 or more for your damage type. It's really, really one of the, part of the true meta. It's one of the best skills in the game. So what's allowing you to easily reach 100% affinity on your targets. And so Dragon King Eye Patch gives you two levels of it in a large decoration slot, which comes into play when you don't have enough large decoration slots. Usually you don't see a problem with that though. Usually you don't. In fact, what you normally see people taking is the Nergigante Helmet. So the Nergigante Helmet gives you two levels of maximum might. Maximum might and weakness exploit are kind of going hand in hand. Maximum might at level three will give you 30% affinity, but you have to have a full stamina bar. Well, the Nergigante Helmet's giving you two levels of that and two small decoration slots, which is useful for all kinds of things in the build. It could be more crit eye, could be for two elemental uh, damage types, like more water damage, more fire damage, or it could be being used for like vitality. After the Nergi Helmet, we have the Guild Cross Circlet. Guild Cross Circlet is often called a terrific defensive helmet. I, I kind of question that. Uh, lately, I've been feeling like Tool Specialist might be more useful than Divine Blessing. Divine Blessing, the way it works is you have a chance of a move uh, having the damage cut by percentage. When you cut damage by percentages, this is really powerful against high damage moves. However, I feel like the fact that it's kind of done by lottery, you have to have a chance of it triggering, I'm kind of put off by that a bit. What's nice about it though is it's a very efficient piece of armor. You have three small decoration slots that let you build vitality and two levels of divine blessing built in. So you really only need one more small decoration slot and you're gonna have both skills. Here's the Kolv Helmet Alpha. It gives you one level of free element ammo up, two levels of agitator. If you see somebody using this helmet, it's probably because they have a cluster bomb build. And that's about the only time I ever see this helmet being used. Agitator, of course, is raising your damage. Free element ammo up is raising the amount of cluster bombs you can hold in your uh, clip at the same time, right? So it's like a very niche build. It's the only time I see it. But cluster bombs are one of the strongest damage sources in the game. So I figured it deserved to be talked about. 
Here's the Kushala Helmet Beta. You can see it has the same efficiency as the Guild Cross Helmet. Notice though you're getting two levels of ice attack and three small decoration slots. So this is very useful for something like a bow because bows need to build critical eye, they need to build attack boost four, and the, you know, if you're using an ice bow, you're gonna need ice attack if you're trying to bring up your ice damage, which you very much are trying to build up your ice damage. Here's the Basil Helm beta. It's gonna be part of the defense meta. For building earplugs, there's really just one or two monsters where I recommend building earplugs, and it's only gonna be in the case that you can afford to build earplugs, which is not often, okay? So you would take this and you would pair it with the earplugs charm to get five levels of earplugs, and you'd still be left over with the large decoration slot and a small decoration slot. So it's a pretty efficient piece of armor for building earplugs. And that's it for the helmets. Let's move on to talking about the chest pieces. Starting us out, we have the Zora Hide Gamma. So this is the Zora Gamma chest piece. It's going to be part of the defense meta. It gives you two levels of tremor resistance, which you can use against Arch Temper Zenishiva. Of course, that's an important fight because it gives you, you know, the Zenishiva Gamma armor. It's giving you three small decoration slots. The tremor resist too is actually just efficient enough that you're not going to be true comboed into any of Arch Temper Zenishiva's attacks. So it's actually really useful for that. The Empress male beta chest plate is next. This is the peak performance chest plate. You see people point it out all the time because it helps weapons that have good affinity but low, low attack damage, low attack values compete with weapons like the Devil Joe weapons. However, I've never been a big fan of the Empress male beta. If you've watched me, I, I rarely use it and that's because it's impractical. So if you're fighting something like, let's say Ancient Leshen, you're gonna take chip damage no matter what, completely useless. Arch-Tempered Valhazak, completely useless. Arch-Tempered Teostra, Arch-Tempered Lunastra, completely useless, right? So you have some fights where it's useful only if you have a health regen augmentation and you can mostly keep your health up, which if you're playing multiplayer isn't really as true. Speedrunners are able to take advantage of the Empress Mail really well because they trip the monster and they, they flinch the monster. They're really uh, very effective at this because they have their whole attack plan kind of set up beforehand and they're able to control it because they don't have teammates messing anything up. They have the monster's aggro. But when you're, when you're in a group, it's much harder to take advantage of peak performance in my opinion. So this is part of the meta. I would say it's part of like the speedrunner meta. But for more like a quality build where it's maybe like 85, 15 damage defense, it's not as useful. I don't, I don't recommend it quite as much. Uh, that's my two cents on it though. Next on our list is the Kieran Jacket Gamma. This is giving you two levels of free element slash ammo up. I explained why this is a meta skill. This is for damage. It increases the clip of your bow gun or it unlocks a secondary damage type such as elemental damage or ailment damage. So this is a really important chest plate. It especially gets used on a lot of bow gun builds now that we have the Zenjiva Gamma Armor because the Zenjiva Gamma Armor takes up the lower half of your body, the arms, the coil, and the legs. Kieran Jacket goes on your chest. So you very commonly see these paired together. One of the weaknesses of this, of course, it has bad fire defense and so does all of the Arch Temper Zenjiva Armor. So you just end up with really negative fire defense and a lot of the monsters in the game deal a lot of high fire damage. So it's kind of risky. Before we move on, let's give an honorable mention to the Kolf Taroth Ira Alpha. This is the Kolf chest plate and it's giving you two levels of critical boost built into the armor. It's one of the best pieces of armor for building critical boost if you don't have the decoration. So a lot of budget builds I'll use will often consider this critical boost because it's, you know, it's a big part of how you're getting your damage output. We mentioned it before, here it is again, the Damascus Male Beta, two levels of focus, three small decoration slots. You'll notice I haven't been talking about the Teostra armor and I haven't been talking about the Draken armor. We already covered it. Damascus is a standalone piece of armor, that's why we're covering it again. <laughs> Here's the Urgon Male Alpha. It's also an honorable mention. This is used against Arch-Tempered Kulftaroth in stages two and three in order to break her mantle. After you've unlocked the Part Breaker decorations, you'll really never use this again. In the Arms Armor slot, there aren't any really meta pieces of Van Braces that I wanna talk about. They don't stand out to me enough. Uh, you have the ones that we already talked about, the Draken Arms, these are really efficient. Then you have the Zenishiva Gamma Arms. These are used for building spare shot, right? That's for the bow guns. And it's, again, pretty efficient. And then you also have the Teostra Arms. That would be Teostra Gamma. This is for building Critical Eye. And Teostra Alpha. This is for building Weakness Exploit. I mean, there's there's a few pieces of armor that stand out, like the, the Gala Suit Cuffs especially stand out, and the Lunastra Beta Van Braces for wide range stand out. But the majority of the time, you don't want to give up Master's Touch. You don't want to give up Spare Shot. So... I don't want to call these other 
Vein Brace is meta, if that makes sense. They're good, but they're not meta. Now, the Waste Lot is going to be a different story. For the Coils, you actually have a lot of viable meta options, and the reason for this is because with the Draken Armor, the Coil is one of the weakest parts of the Draken Armor. Likewise, in the Teostra Gamma setup for Master's Touch, the Coil slot is just left open, so we actually have a lot of different Coils to look through here. Starting us off, we have a defensive coil with Empress Coil Beta. This is building two levels of Tool Specialist and two medium decoration slots. Tool Specialist is pretty high up when it comes to the defense meta, when it comes to defense skills. You've got Vitality at the top. After Vitality, it really depends on are you playing multiplayer or are you playing solo? If you're playing multiplayer, the next skill is going to be Wide Range with Gobbler and Satiated. If you're playing by yourself, it's going to be Fortitude, right? And then after Fortitude and Wide Range, I'd probably choose Tool Specialist as the next best defensive skill. Either Tool Specialist or arguably Fire Resistance. It just depends on what you're fighting. Fighting Ancient Leshen, Tool Specialist. Are you fighting Lunastra? You're going to choose Fire Defense before you choose Tool Specialist. So the matchup does count, but Tool Specialist does rank high, and it's primarily because it's giving you back Rock Steady Mantle, and it's giving you back the Temporal Mantle, and th those are really powerful, right? Like, if you're fighting Extreme Behemoth, having the Temporal Mantle is kind of a big deal, and that's why Tool Specialist is ranking high for defense. After Emperor's Coil, I want to talk about the Kulv Taroth Malice Gamma. So this is from the Arch-Tempered Kulv Taroth fight. It's not hard to fight her, by the way, so go unlock this. This gave us a new way to build critical boost and weakness exploit in the waste slot. And what it really did was it gave us a way to add more medium decorations, large decorations to our builds. It's useful, especially for the Teostra Gamma armor set. The Draken Coil, I feel like it's not really as necessary, but... Uh, if you really needed that large decoration slot, then you could trade that out with the Draken Coil. I, I don't think I've ever done that personally, but I have done it with the Kulf Gamma set. Then we have Ceres Torsa Alpha. It's not part of the meta, it doesn't deserve an honorable mention. However, it's the sexiest piece of armor in all of the armor slots. After that, we're going to talk about the Kushala Cocoon Gamma. This is one of the truly meta pieces of armor. It gives you two levels of handicraft, two small decoration slots. And the reason why this ended up being so powerful is because with Master's Touch, you really only need a sliver of white sharpness, just a tiny amount of it, in order to keep your white sharpness up, because after that, you only need 100% affinity, and it's going to trigger all the time, right? Well, turns out there are a number of weapons that need two levels of handicraft to reach that sliver of white sharpness, and Kushala Cocoon is able to deliver that very efficiently to the Draken armor sets. So this actually gets used in a number of builds, and I highly recommend it. The Valhazat Coil Gamma, uh, I used to use this more often. I don't really feel like I use it quite as much anymore. I think it's just because we have so many options, especially with the Kushala Coil came out and the Kulf Taroth Coil came out. But this is still a strong option if you're trying to build up Dragon Attack for something, right? You're going to get one level of Dragon Attack, two empty small decoration slots, and a medium decoration slot, right? The recovery speed, I feel, is not that useful at all. It's a defensive skill. I don't rank this high at all. It supposedly pairs with Super Recovery, but honestly, I'm not a big fan of it either way. So I just see it as uh, three slots with the Dragon Attack as well. And again, if you're building Dragon Damage, then yeah, it might actually be your best option for your Coil slot. Now, Zora Spine, on the other hand, Zora Spine Gamma, this is definitely meta. This is going to be used all the time for fighting Arch-Tempered Kulvtaroth, gives you two levels of Bombardier, and a level of Crit Eye. Crit Eye is useful against Arch-Tempered Kushala de Aura because a lot of the time, Static Affinity is going to outplay uh, Weakness Exploit Affinity because Weakness Exploit only works when she's glowing red. So Critical Eye is a great skill. Bombardier is a great skill. As you know, Arch-Tempered Kulf Taroth, she takes bonus Bombardier damage. And then you got the Large Decoration Slot and the Medium Decoration Slot. So all around, this is a, really an S-tier coil for fighting Arch-Tempered Kulf Taroth. Almost all my Arch-Tempered Kulf Taroth builds use this. Kulv Malice Beta. I haven't used this in a very long time. In theory, it's very efficient. It gives you one level of free element, one level of handicraft, a large decoration slot, and a small decoration slot. So if you had a weapon, and it was a meta weapon that used this particular coil, both to unlock an element and build handicraft, then this would indeed be a meta coil. I just can't think of any weapons that currently do that, so we'll give it an honorable mention. The Uragon Coil Beta is also getting an honorable mention. Once again, if you don't have the Part Breaker decorations, go ahead and use this coil until you do. Uh, it's very important for fighting Arch-Tempered Kulf Taroth in stages 2 and 3 when you're trying to break her mantle over and over again. Finally, we move on to the Leg Slot. I'm going to start off with the Empress Greaves Beta. Empress Greaves Beta is very efficient for building Health Boost. I've told you before, I believe Health Boost is the number one defensive skill in the game. So on occasion, you can actually drop the Draken uh, Greaves 
and replace them with the Empress Greaves. It sounds surprising, but you don't actually need the Dragon Greaves that much. If you skip building Attack Boost, Attack Boost is nice, it's just not super necessary, and you might actually want Health Boost on your build instead. On top of that, you have another really efficient defensive legs option called the Empress Greaves Alpha, and this is being used for building wide range. Take a look at it. It comes with five small decoration slots. So it, one's empty, the four others are filled with health boost and wide range, but it still adds up to five. That's nuts, that's a lot. There really isn't any other armor in the game that's this generous because it's also giving you a medium decoration slot as well. This is what I use to build meta wide range builds is this particular piece of armor. So this gets a really good grade as well. And then you have a third pair of defensive legs. It's the Kul Taroth Wrath Gamma. These are the Kul Laves Gamma. You have Agitator 2, which is nice. It adds a little bit of damage to your build. Most importantly, though, you're getting Heat Guard, a large decoration slot, and a small decoration slot. So that Heat Guard is a big deal for fighting Arch Tempers and Ashiva. And it's not hard to build the Kul Taroth Wrath Gamma. As I said before, Arch Tempered Kul Taroth is actually a pretty easy fight. So you get these legs, and then when you go back to fight Arch Tempers and Ashiva, you never really have to deal with the hot floor. It's a big advantage. It's much better than what people used to do. They used to build Heat Guard in the Charm slot, which is highly inefficient. Okay, so this is a terrific defensive legs for fighting Arch Tempers and Shiva. It's very niche, but it deserves to be mentioned. We're going to go ahead and give an honorable mention to the Kirin Leg Guards beta. These used to be the meta. But things changed after we got the Zenashiva Gamma Armor and started building Zenashiva Legs in that slot, right? So now we use the Kirin Chest Plate from the Kirin Gamma Armor set and pair that with the Zenashiva Armor. And the old Kirin Leg Guards Beta rarely get used. In fact, I can't remember the last time I used them. Uh, but maybe there's some strange build that uses them. If it exists, you guys feel free to share about it. But I doubt that it would be a meta build. So these are now an honorable mention. Finally, we'll wrap things up with the Death Stench Heal Beta. It's giving you two levels of handicraft and two small decorations. You'll notice this is the same efficiency as the Kushala Gamma Coil, but they're competing for different armor slots. So the leg slot is a lot more competitive than the coil slot, which is why we never use this and we very often use the Kushala Coil. All right, and that's all of the armor, head, chest, arms, waist, and legs. The last thing I'm going to do is share my top 10 list of charms with you. I could do this in a separate video, maybe I'll do this later, uh, but I felt like it wouldn't be appropriate to talk about meta armor without also talking about meta charms a little bit, and we're 37 minutes into the video, who cares? It's already a long video anyways. Let's go ahead and do this, it'll just take a minute. So my top 10 choices go like this. We have the Handicraft Charm, the Artillery Charm, Weakness Exploit, Maximum Might, Free Element, Focus, Critical Eye, Constitution, wide range, and health boost. That's all 10. You'll notice attack boost didn't make the list. I think attack boost is nice for speedrunners. Not quite as nice for the average player. The average player would be better off with three levels of health boost, three levels of wide range. Critical eye makes it onto the list because having that static affinity is actually really important for reaching 100% affinity, which is how the whole master's touch crit, crit boost three, kind of like synergy is working. Uh, artillery, of course, is always going to take up three slots and anytime we can fill in a three slot skill is really important. Also, it's very important for damage, right? So none of these choices sh should surprise you. These are the, my top 10 choices for the charm slots. And with that being said, I think we're done here. I think I've talked about everything I wanted to talk about. You should have a very good idea of what the armor meta is, which pieces of armor to go for first. And if you have particular questions about what skills you should be bringing for each weapon, I'd be happy to talk about that in the comment section. I'm sure the other people in the comment section would be happy to help you with that as well. So feel free to leave your questions. I especially want to thank Justin, Brandon Peng, and Tyler Crooms for making donations to me in Patreon in April. Thank you very much, guys. It was very appreciated. All right. Well, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.